Hi, and thanks for joining us for Phosphorus Science Now. I'm Matt Schultz with the Sustainable Phosphorus Alliance, and I'm joined today by Dr. Jörg Schaller. He's from University of Bayreuth in Germany, and he's written a paper that was published late last year in Scientific Reports entitled, Silicon Increases the Phosphorus Availability of Arctic Soils. The reason I chose this paper to discuss is we have a lot of interest in how we can better mine phosphorus from soils. Plants need phosphorus to grow, and there can often be a lot of phosphorus in soils, but the plants can't get to it because it's not bioavailable. That phosphorus can be bound to organic matter or it can be absorbed to other minerals, for example. And what this paper speaks to is one method to mobilize that pool of phosphorus and make it available to plants. This is really important if you want to draw down phosphorus that's in soils and very um, in phosphorus replete areas. It's also important in places like sub-Saharan Africa where the soils are typically considered phosphorus poor because the phosphorus is not available for plants. So without further ado, I'd like to welcome you, Jörg, to Phosphorus Science Now. Yes, thanks a lot too. <laughs> uh, can you tell us about your collaborator in Denmark and, uh, and where you yeah. get funding? Yes, yeah, so we get funding from German Science Foundation, and my collaborator is, is Bo, or was Bo Elberling uh, for the University of Copenhagen, the, the Center of Permafrost Research, because we uh, yeah we decided to to use undisturbed soils, so not not being affected from human activity, and with this we decided to use um, permafrost soils, and the Center for Permafrost was able to supply us with with more than hundred different permafrost soils, so that's um, why we had this collaboration. Okay, uh, Jörg, so please start telling us a bit about the role of silicon in soils. So you may know that um, silicon is a compound in, in a lot of soil minerals, as you can see also here. So quartz and the silicas, olivines, peroxides, feldspar, mica, and also clay minerals. But the thing is, it is um, quite abundant, but not always available. So it's not um, reactive. For quartz, for instance, is, is totally unavailable, the most um, of the silica stored in there. So it will not lead to a, a leaching of a silicic acid out of the, of the quartz in, in, in high amounts to, to get really a change into the geochemistry um, processes. But the biogenic silica, let's say phytoliths or diatoms, is after little recycling available at least in some share. The same holds true for some silica gels. And of course, the most uh, available form is the silicic acid in the soil um, pore water. But mostly the availability depends on the um, amorphous silica content in the soil. And this is, yeah, in most soils in a quite big range from zero to 6%, whereas the, the forest soils, Lower export every year have or tend to, to higher concentrations of amorphous silica. And in contrast to this, agricultural soils have much lower amounts of um, amorphous silica, roughly 1% or lower, because um, you may know that most of um, crop plants like cereals um, are known as silicon accumulators and with each year harvest, you export not only the biomass, but with the biomass also available silicon from the soils, then leading to much lower concentrations of um, silicon or silicic acid in soil pore waters, which is yeah most uh, commonly in, in a range up to two millimole per liter, but in, in most agricultural soils is more or less tendency to the, to the lower end. Yeah. And then, leading to a, a low silicic acid availability in those pore waters and with this low reaction of silicic acid with, with minerals and, and nutrients. Yeah, so um, one of the interesting things you went into in your paper was your discussion about how patterns of land use affect the silicon in the soils and how that in turn impacts phosphorus mobilization. And can you walk us through that? Yes, of course. So um, there was a quite nice uh, paper from the group of Eric Stroy from Antwerp uh, University, uh, clearly showing that um, that a forest cycles high amounts of, of silicon every year by 
silicic acids that dissolve silica uptake into the biomass and then uh, little decomposition or recycling of um, this amorphous um, silica pool stored in the plant and um, in the soil leading to interaction with mineral silicates but also to mobilization of dissolved silica again. But this large pool drops rapidly if you change the, the system to uh, agricultural uh, soil because you have first a, a strong export because you, you change the system you have no vegetation left but um, later on you have yeah, a crop system with crop plant um, production and every year harvest and with uh, with the crop plants a lot of crop plants being silicon accumulators you export quite large amounts of um, available silicon from the uh, soils every year by crop harvest and this is what's shown in this paper quite nicely and at the end we, we thought yeah how this is changing our agricultural systems and we uh, started an experiment where we used some some wheat plants and cultivated those plants under different uh, silicon availability from low to high silicon availability and as you can see here you increase strongly the biomass production increasing uh, silicon availability and also a little bit of grain production so we have this effect on the carbon turnover but we looked also for um, phosphorus accumulation in those plants and it was quite nice because we got a strong effect so increase of plant phosphorus status with increasing uh, silicon availability this was quite nice finding um, the same was also shown for rice plants before and at this point we we started thinking yeah what's the underlying mechanism for this and to to get a picture on this explanation or a, on the broad range for a lot of soils we cooperated with with Bo Elberling from the um, Saint Perms, or Center for Permafrost in University of Copenhagen because he was able to supply us with a large amount of different soils with different properties unaffected by human activities. So we, yeah, we went to the Arctic or they went for, to the Arctic and um, sampled more than 100 different soils and we analyzed them for phosphorus availability and um, silicon availability. And as you can see here, we got a strong correlation between the silicon availability in those soils and the phosphorus availability. So there is an effect, but again, we like to find out the underlying mechanism for this. Uh, to test this, um, we used two highly different soils from Greenland, one from, from the far north, so Perryland, with a really high pH of 8.4, and then from Disco Island, more in the south part, with a much lower pH, and we incubated them with different silicon availabilities and also calcium availability because, uh, because uh, calcium is known to reduce uh, phosphorus availability at least at high soil pH and in this case of Perryland soil the pH was quite high with 8.4 and so in this quite corner here is the control treatment without any addition and we increased the silicon availability in this direction and as you can see if you increase the silicon availability you increase the phosphorus mobilization to the soil pore waters shown here but if you increase the calcium availability you decrease the phosphorus mobilization to um, soil pore waters this is shown here for the for the soil with the high ph but as i said before we did the same for uh, the uh, soils from disco island with a ph of 5.6 here you can see the same silicon effect so if you increase the silicon availability, you always increase the phosphorus mobilization to the soil pore waters, but we had no calcium effect at all, which could be easily explained because at this pH, you have no calcium carbonate precipitation, though this is starting at a yeah, pH of seven, roughly. And with a calcium carbonate precipitation, you get always a calcium phosphate precipitation what we have seen for the uh, peridant soil but in in soils with much lower pH you have no negative calcium effect 
But again, yeah, this is a, is a fact, but how is um, silicon mobilizing the phosphorus from the, from the strong binding um, to the soil minerals for this? To find out um, this, we went to uh, the Canadian light source and the um, collaboration partner of us, um, Martin Obst, uh, is an expert in um, X-ray absorption spectroscopy. And we analyzed um, two different samples here and read the control treatment without any addition. And you can see you have a strong virionite peak, so iron 2 phosphate, and then you have a mixture of ferrohydrite and butyrite. And for the silicon treatment shown here in yeah, slightly purple, you can see that the virionite peak is reduced. So we get a mo we got a mobil mobilization of vivianite or the phosphorus from vivianite by silicon, yeah, by the by increasing silicon availability, and this you can explain this um, by that the silicic acid is deprotonating at the iron surface, and um, afterwards competing with the phosphate for binding at the iron minerals, and at those levels, um, silicic acid is able to mobilize phosphorus from the strong binding to the iron minerals and uh, with this changing the iron mineralogy. We also checked for the for the overall effect on the carbon and for the carbon it's the same. If you increase the silicon availability here again for the perilent soil, you increase the soil respiration and if you increase the calcium availability, you decrease the soil respiration. And the same holds true for the for the um, disco island soil with the much lower pH. And one thing is, of course, the phosphorus availability because those microbes need phosphorus as a nutrient to better perform. And um, if they have phosphorus available, then they can, of course, increase the um, phosphorus product uh, that the CO two resp or production respiration. But as we have seen for the lower pH soil Disco Island, we had no negative effect um, on the phosphorus, but we see here a negative effect of calcium availability on the CO2 production. And this can be explained by um, cation bridging. So calcium ions are able to, yeah, to bind free organic metal and make them unavailable for microbes. So that at the end, we have no negative effect on the carbon turnover if we increase the silicon availability for, to increase the uh, phosphorus availability, potentially to use it in agricultural soils. So then, yeah, the question would arise, how is this affecting the, the carbon pool? But we have shown that if you simultaneously increase the calcium availability, you can have both. You can have a high um, phosphorus availability from the increase in silicon availability and at the same time if you fertilize the soils um, also with calcium then you can decrease the soil respiration and the, the mechanisms we we think it happened is that the silicon is mobilizing the phosphorus so phosphorus is known to to mobilize um, organic metal so at the end we have more organic metal and more phosphorus available so not only phosphor for the plants, but also for the, for the soil microbes. So this is then increasing soil respiration. But if you increase at the same time the calcium availability, you can um, get rid of those negative effects um, on the carbon turnover and you have only the positive effect on the phosphorus availability, at least for soils um, with a pH yeah, roughly lower than seven. So this is the overall story. That's very interesting, Eric. So, are you going to test other soil types as a next step? Yeah, we now get got funding for another project where we like to test so at the at the soil gradient, so soil phosphorus gradient, and maybe yeah, we will also check for different soil minerals, um, how silicon is mobilizing the phosphorus from from the different soil minerals. So we know from literature this is the silicon is also able to mobilize phosphorus from um, some aluminum hydroxides. But the question is, to which extent um, silicon is also able to um, the phosphorus from iron-3 binding. 
the iron three manures because iron two we have shown in, in this paper, but the binding of phosphorus to iron two is not that strong like to iron three. But we will check whether we are also able to mobilize this much stronger binding to iron three uh, also by increasing um, silicon availability. Very interesting. And so a lot of times uh, this knowledge takes a long time to translate into hydrologic models. And do you have a plan for integrating this information into those models? So yeah, we are currently, we have currently a project uh, for uh, peatland where we tested this, but not for agricultural soil. So for this, we have to first to apply for funding to get such a project funded then at the end. Yeah, it's always money. <laughs> There's always money, yes. <laughs> well, thanks so much for joining us for Phosphorus Science Now, Jörg. It was a really interesting paper. Yeah, thank you too.